Ladies and gentlemen, what a wonderful sight uh, to see you all here today. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, the National Constitution Center. As you may not have heard uh, before, <laughs> is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Hooray! We can all do it by heart now. And what a treat we have uh, this afternoon. Uh, I am so thrilled to welcome back to the National Constitution Center the great historian Richard Reeves and my predecessor and the founding father of the National Constitution Center, Joe Torcella. This is a dream team and you are in for a real uh, treat. Uh, a few plugs for upcoming programs and then I will introduce both of them uh, next Tuesday. In Boston, we are hosting the second of our traveling town halls, co-sponsored by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society. The question is, was the Citizens United case rightly or wrongly decided? We think that these traveling town halls, which are gonna go across the country to New York in June, to Chicago and San Francisco and Michigan in the fall, will transform constitutional debate, just like the Lincoln-Douglas debates uh, did as well, and it's so exciting to host them. Um, you know from our great uh, lineup about the superb programs that are coming up here at the center. Next week on May 12th, we have a screening of 14 Dred Scott, Juan Kim Ark, and Vanessa Lopez, including the descendants of Dred Scott and Juan Kim Ark, two plaintiffs in some of the most significant his, uh, Supreme Court cases of all time. On May 13th, the renowned historian Joseph Ellis is coming for his new book on the Articles of Confederation and the US Constitution. And in June, we are kicking off a phenomenal debate about whether the Constitution requires the states to recognize marriage equality with our friends at Intelligence Squared. That debate will be held uh, just uh, days before our new exhibit speaking out for equality, the Supreme Court, the Constitution, and gay rights opens, and weeks before the Supreme Court hands down its historic decision in the marriage equality cases. So that will be a really exciting time at the center. Uh, now, it is my great honor to introduce our participants. Uh, Richard Reeves' books have uh, educated and enlightened me and so many uh, lovers of American history over the years. He is the author of best-selling biographies, both of President Kennedy and of President Nixon. I think uh, he's written two of the best biographies on those two rivals uh, in American history, and I was just so interested but not at all surprised to learn that President Nixon had a copy of Richard Reeves's biography of President Kennedy on his desk after he left the White House. That's how good a uh, book it was. And he's here, of course, to discuss his uh, new book on the Japanese internment. And interviewing him is my great predecessor and friend, Joe Torsella. I can uh, introduce him no better except to note that there's a plaque uh, at the top of the stairs as you walk up to the Constitution Center. Uh, it's in the middle of the beautiful marble wall, and it quotes uh, Christopher Wren on the St. Paul's uh, Cathedral. If you would see his monument, look around him. Everything here at the National Constitution Center, all of the phenomenal contributions we make to education and debate about the Constitution are due to this great man, Joe Torcella, and every time he comes back to his home, we are uh, all the better for it. Please join me in welcoming Richard Reeves and Joe Torcella. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. And Welcome to what I think is the only institution chartered by Congress to discuss <laughs> constitutional issues. And welcome to uh, a wonderful historian and writer in American, Richard Reeves, and congratulations on Thank you. the publication of a, a really a powerful and important uh, and compelling, uh, even for the darkness of the story, and I think timely, I think you'll tell right. us new, new book. Uh, I wanted to ask you first, um, you talk in the introduction and then again in the epilogue about sort of how you came to write this now and the evolution in your own uh, and, and in American views of this chapter. Can you share with us how, wh why you chose to write it now and how you arrived at the topic? Well, I, I seem to do things in batches because I did the three presidential books and then 
after Abu Ghraib, I felt like almost any American felt that this was not the America that I grew up in or wanted to be part of. And it was, I wanted to write a book about what was best about America. And I did a book called Daring Young Men on the Berlin Airlift, uh, when young men who had just given up three or four years of their lives had gone on to new lives, colleges, wives, jobs, and suddenly were called back and within 48 hours, this is 1948, uh, were uh, flying in Berlin, uh, food, drugs, fuel, uh, to the people who had been trying to kill them. And I thought, that was my America. Then as events developed after that, I really wrote this book because I was always interested in the subject. Uh, I mean, it's a fascinating subject in many ways. Uh, but I really wrote the book because I don't want it to happen again. And there is a history in the country, even going beyond slavery and the treatment of, of the Native Americans, of Indians, that each immigrant group as it comes to the country, and we bring them in for labor, the Chinese and the railroads, the Eastern Europeans and steel and uh, slaughter uh, houses, uh, Irish need not apply, Jews have always had their problems. and. I, I realized that, in, and then this happens to the Japanese, uh, I realized that we, re, we greet people, we have traditionally greeted people, uh, but not thought they were like us until they were us, until they were all of us here. We all came from some part. And then as the tension grew between uh, the West and Islamic countries, there, I want to do my bit to make sure the same thing doesn't happen again, uh, either to Muslims or to uh, border crosses. Uh, all the plans still exist, and despite the fact uh, that the people charged, or the few people who sued uh, for uh, the government for what they did to them uh, in the Japanese, they won. However, no law was ever changed. The laws are all on the books to do the exact same thing again. They were very cleverly drawn at the time, and they could be reinstituted in, in a matter of days or weeks. So I don't want that to happen. Well, I, I want to follow up on that. First, one bit of housekeeping uh, is I think there are cards for questions from all of you uh, that the Constitution Center staff will collect. And then, of course, you have at the end of this an opportunity to get your copy of the book and a signed copy of the book downstairs. Um, but you, uh, one of the surprising things to me in this book was the number of unexpected villains, uh, and as well as, I think, uh, from my point of view, some unexpected heroes. Um, we all know, I think, that FDR uh, signed the order, although I think we probably don't all know that the order never mentioned Japanese Americans. Right. But uh, Earl Warren, a kind of icon of constitutional progress, uh, Dr. Seuss, uh, Wal uh, uh, Lipman, and uh, uh, Edward R. Murrow, all in one way or another kind of complicit in this, uh, more than complicit. Were you su as surprised as some of your readers might be by the I details was, of that? Yeah, I was stunned. Uh, I was shocked. Uh, I knew enough about Warren to know that he had been a figure, but the, the Los Angeles Times review of, of the book said it had the, uh, if you judge a book by the class of its villains, uh, then this compares with Antigone. <laughs> uh, I turned the page hoping like hell they would Compare me to Sophocles, but <laughs> that didn't happen. Well, we can do uh, it here. It's now in the record. Uh, right. What uh, it was a, a terrible time of, uh, and the and the combination, the hysterical combination, of fear. After all, the Japanese had just bombed ja Imperial Japanese had just bombed Pearl Harbor. Of racism, uh, you must remember that from 1924 to 1952 people of Japanese descent could not become American citizens. 
uh, they, their children could be citizens if they were born here, but the first generation were not, never allowed to naturalize or become citizens. So the racism uh, was there, the fear was there, and then there was enormous greed. The Japanese had become successful, particularly in California, and they, they produced 40% of the agricultural product of the greatest agricultural state in the world. Uh, and then suddenly they were rounded up, no charges, uh, and taken away in camps. And that land and their fishing boats uh, and their businesses, most of it ended up in other people's hands because, among other things, their bank accounts were all frozen. So they couldn't pay mortgages, they couldn't pay insurance. California's the sheet laws were such <coughs> that uh, the state could distribute uh, their land and their property to other people, and they did that. And the man behind most of that was the Attorney General of California, who was Earl Warren, who rode the backs of, of the Japanese to the Japanese Americans uh, to the governorship, and then later, as we know, became Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, and, and his contribution to it was double. One is he was respected even then uh, as a politician, and politicians react to the press. The first two weeks after Pearl Harbor, the press in California, the Hearst Papers, the LA Times, were filled with American calls for tolerance. Uh, but as the fear grew uh, and politicians responded, uh, more and more the press drove, uh, drove the issue that we've got to get rid of these people. And the law, which never mentioned race, uh, was uh, put together in a way to create war zones. And then the army would have the power to remove any citizen uh, from those war zones and incarcerate them without charges. Uh, the, it, it was clearly unconstitutional, but that didn't, uh, that didn't stop any of it. And the only people, of course, who they took out of those zones, which was Washington, Oregon, California, and part of Arizona, uh, were Japanese Americans. They did not uh, do the same to German Americans or, uh, or Italian Americans for the very good reason that if they did that, uh, they would have had to incarcerate in, in camps 50 million people. 50 million Americans at that time were descended from people with German stock and Italian stock. And he, uh, Warren also persuaded in a flying visit the best known newspaper columnist in the country, the greatest public, one of the great public intellectuals, Walter Lippmann, uh, to write two columns with his, with the uh, Warren theory, which was there had never been a single act of sabotage uh, by the Japanese in America uh, or in Hawaii. Uh, however, that was taken as proof by Warren that there would be one huge coordinated act of terrorism against the country. Lippmann wrote that in the, his column, and two days later, Roosevelt, with the cover of, of the press, uh, particularly that particular member of the press, uh, signed Executive Order 9066, which led to the roundup of the Japanese. Edward R. Murrow was from Washington, was, uh, and he traveled Washington State giving speeches saying that when the Japanese came to destroy us, which he said they surely would, uh, that if you looked up at those planes, the men flying them will be wearing Washington and Washington State uh, sweatshirts. Uh, Theodore Geisel was the uh, cartoonist for the most left-wing newspaper in the country, PM, in New York City. And his drawings, uh, some in the book, uh, were vicious drawings of Japanese buck-tooth uh, big glasses uh, coming all the way down the West Coast to collect dynamite. And then there were some of them with spy glasses. And the thing was called waiting, uh, waiting for the signal 
from Tokyo. Uh, and so that it was, the, and, and another villain in the book was a man I think probably less known today, but Roger Baldwin, who founded uh, the American Civil Liberties Union. And he was a great friend of Roosevelt. Uh, and he, like members of the Supreme Court, were determined to protect Roosevelt uh, from any criticism of this. So uh, among other things, all the young attorneys in the ACLU quit after they were told they could not mention race in any case uh, they brought. And, uh, and the Supreme Court did its bit by delaying any decisions until after Roosevelt was reelected in 1944, and uh, then two days later said, this is an outrage to all these people in camps. We have to do something about it. Uh, I, I, I did think it was harrowing to read of the change that you mentioned from the calls for tolerance within weeks yeah. uh, to really quite striking and disturbing. Uh, there were headlines uh, like brown men here to rape white women, uh, that that was the real reason they wanted to to go to war for us. There were, there were descriptions of uh, weapons being found. Yes, weapons were found when they searched because the Japanese owned a lot of sporting goods stores uh, in California at that time. Uh, and so it was one horror story after another of submarines coming. There was only one submarine between Japanese submarine between the West Coast and Hawaii, and ironically, on, on the Atlantic coast, they were sinking a lot of tonnage, German, uh, but we never uh, talked about that as in the way that the one submarine was talked about in Japan, and then came the Battle of Los Angeles uh, when uh, anti-aircraft guns over the city fired for eight hours at what they believed was the Japanese invading Air Force, they didn't even get the target, which wasn't Japanese. It was a Navy weather balloon. Uh, so we were hardly prepared for war, but we were also hardly prepared for the fear and the lying. I mean, lies, lies, lies by the Army uh, that, uh, that took part, uh, that took place at that time. I want to come back uh, both to what you said about greed and, and to Earl Warren and your speculation about him in constitutional history in a minute. But on the other side, there are also some surprising heroes. Uh, I mean, most notably the, the, the yeah. Japanese Americans who were interned, but, right. and as well as the members of the Go for Broke. Well, the Japanese Americans went to the camps without a whimper because they thought it was their patriotic duty. They were fiercely and, patriotic very touch, people. Very touching stories yeah. about, uh, and of course, it ruined many, uh, many of their lives. Uh, the unlikely hero. There were a few people in the government who said, "You know, this is unconstitutional." One of them this was a Philadelphian, American. I note. But one of them, <laughs> the one, uh, not the most prominent, but one of them was J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, <laughs> but there was. Re Hoover had two reasons. One is the FBI did have a list, of, they weren't very sophisticated lists, of, of people, Japanese Americans, they thought could be potentially dangerous. But also the FBI had run Hawaii. And in Hawaii, half the population was Japanese. They were never interned, and there was no sabotage. So he had that experience, but mainly, he wanted to run the program, not the Army. It was a turf war, and the Army kept saying we're in an imminent danger, and he kept saying there is no danger like that. The Justice Department, the FBI, can take care of this problem uh, without involving uh, the Army and troops. So he was right, but probably his reason was that he wanted to accrue more power to to his agency, since that was always his constant goal. And talk a little bit, because we're in Philadelphia, about Attorney General Biddle, uh, who was a voice of uh, for constitutionalism. Right. The, uh, the Attorney General of the United States then, uh, I, I want to say Nicholas Biddle, but that was his great, great grandfather, uh, was, had just come into office. 
we were a very, a country united by the beginning of the war. The Germans and the Italians declared war on us as soon as Japan sneak attacked, uh, Imperial Japan uh, attacked us. And Biddle uh, was among the people who thought it was unconstitutional, but he was a young man, a Philadelphia lawyer, I guess he was 42, and had just begun in the job. And when the grand dukes of American policy, people like Henry Stimson, uh, who was the Secretary of War, John McCloy, who was the bright boy uh, of the Defense Department, or the War Department, it was called then, uh, Biddle had his doubts. He wanted to go to the White House, talk to the president. The president said he was too busy. And Biddle decided to, uh, even though his younger uh, subordinates wanted to make a public issue of it, uh, Biddle, even though he agreed with them, felt his duty was not to do anything, and he didn't. By the way, I wouldn't feel bad about I always want to call him Nicholas, too. Yeah. But when Prince Charles was here a couple years ago, he told the story about one of his ancestors writing home in 1920 after the first royal visit to America. I was in Philadelphia, and I met a distinguished... I met... I had some interesting food called Biddle and met a distinguished family called Scrapple. So <laughs> this is not, this is not uncommon. <laughs> but so the, that's why the Queen stays <laughs> on. <laughs> uh, I must say that... I don't know if you're supposed to bring this up in such August uh, surroundings, but I came across Biddle again. I've always been fascinated with, fascinated with espionage in World War II and uh, found out that Biddle was having an affair with a woman named Vera. I've forgotten her last name. It was a phony name, who was the head of MI5. So the plot, after a the while, he got used to being in power. He sure did. Uh, Talk about, going, going back to Warren, explain you know, some of these characters, and, and you didn't talk here yet about the two who are, I think, in some ways the most villainous, the, the, uh, the DeWitt and... Uh, General ben, DeWitt ben, and ben Colonel Ben Benson. Uh, but a lot of these folks came to, came to deeply regret, as Warren did. Some right. of them didn't. And, and you have a speculation in the book about how Warren's feelings about what happened could have profoundly you know, influenced the way I he influenced don't, the Constitution. I don't even think it's speculation. I mean, as Earl Warren was a very religious man, very rigid uh, sense of his own self-righteousness and of public righteousness. Uh, he, in his memoirs, uh, he only gave one sentence to the internment, uh, and it, he said that he greatly regretted it. Now. He had originally, in his handwriting, it says he regretted it. He died before the memoir came out, and someone added greatly, whether it was at his orders or whatever. But what sealed the case for me, and, and the reason I personally believe that, uh, that the horrors of 1942 and on were what led to the American glories of desegregation uh, when he became Chief Justice. California has a program of oral histories of its governors. They're very elaborate. They're done by the University of California at Berkeley. And his was done by a woman named Amelia Fry, very bright woman. She interviewed him for six days and uh, finally had avoided bringing up the war as much as she could. And on the sixth day, uh, she said, Governor, now I'd like to ask you about the events of 1942. Warren broke into tears, left the room, and never came back. So that was enough to convince me that he lived his life in the shadow of realizing what he had done. On the other hand, some of them uh, like, others, people uh, like others Lipman, defended it to the end. The standard line became uh, that they did it to protect uh, the Japanese from white violence. Uh, there wasn't much white violence at all, but and when they got to the camps, the camps were designed after prisoner of war camps, barbed wire, machine guns, uh, guard towers, searchlights. Uh, they were... It, they were from plans for, for POW camps, 
Uh, well, the Japanese did notice when they got to these 10 camps in the most barren parts of America, places where the winter temperatures were 30 degrees below and the summer 120 above, that the machine guns were pointed in. And they were used on occasion, stupid occasion. Several, more than several, Japanese were, uh, were killed uh, by the guards who were really bored teenagers sitting up in this and they all they wanted to do was talk to the girls in a camp but the girls wouldn't talk to them and in the most famous case a, a deaf Japanese American uh, in Hart Mountain Wyoming uh, was walking along the barbed wire and the guard in the tower decided that he was walking too close and he shouted at him to get away from the wire uh, from the fence well, the man couldn't hear, and the, uh, the soldier shot him in the back, killed him, uh, and then was court-martialed. And he was found guilty in the court-martial, and he was found guilty of misusing government property and fined one dollar to pay for the bullet. Uh, so, well, the living conditions were uh, beyond belief for civilized people, that uh, the, they put, they were in high deserts and the swamps of, of Arkansas. They were where no people lived before and no people have lived since. And they were, uh, they were tar paper shacks called barracks. Uh, so that particularly with sandstorms, which were common in the areas where the camps were, the sand would just come right through uh, right through the walls and pile on the people. And the heat was so great that many of the, of the incarcerated Japanese, again, two-thirds of these people were American citizens. Uh, they had never been charged with anything. They were very, they, they created these small American towns full of Boy Scout troops uh, and uh, baseball leagues, 80 baseball, they loved baseball, 80 baseball leagues in, uh, in one camp, Manzanar. And in one of the few human, uh, human gestures by, because this is a book about Americans, it's not a book about Japanese. Uh, and they were Americans on both sides of, of, the, of the barbed wire. And in Cody, Wyoming, a, uh, uh, a smart uh, scoutmaster uh, brought his troop to the camp at Hart Mountain, uh, the nearest camp, Hart Mountain, Wyoming, for joint uh, events, camperies that they were called, uh, with, with the Japanese Boy Scout troops and the Wyoming uh, Boy Scout troops. And one of the uh, boys in the Cody troop was named Alan Simpson, became a United States Senator uh, uh, for three or four terms. And he, they all shared one Japanese-American, one American-American, as it were, shared pup tents. And his uh, pup tent mate was Norman Mineta, who became the editor, the mayor of San Jose, and then a congressman, and then served uh, in two cabinets of the United States. He was eight years old at the time when he went to the camps. Uh, and one of the things they did was they, all the Japanese, the Japanese kids were like Mickey Rooney and, and Judy Garland. That's the way they dressed. That's the way they acted. They were Americans. They didn't speak Japanese. They loved baseball above all things. And when Norm Mineta left home, you were only allowed when you were rounded up and put on sealed trains uh, and taken to these places, uh, you were only allowed to take what you could carry, which meant usually two suitcases or a suitcase and a baby. Uh, Norman Etta had his baseball bat, glove, ball, whatnot. The, the guards took away the baseball bat. They let him keep the ball and the glove, but they wouldn't let him have the baseball bat. And he turned to his father and he said, why is the government so afraid of me? He was eight years old. Well, the, 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 the book is full of these powerful 
stories like that's very seems very driven by these human stories yeah. of the uh, that one of the of the uh, World War One Japanese American soldier who yeah, right. commits suicide clutching his citation from the U.S. government because he can't believe he's being treated this way. There was very little bitterness, ironically, but the real bitterness was by World War I veterans who were Japanese Americans and who were arrested. The, uh, d d did you, ha in, in telling the story with these anecdotes, was that a, was that a deliberate choice or did they just capture your uh, imagination no, as a way to? No, it was a deliberate choice. I mean, I wanted to make these people real, they were real to me. And they're incredibly gracious. I mean, there was, even though their lives had been ruined, uh, and, and sometimes they were ruined inadvertently. The, the design, they had, they had no cooking facilities and no bath facilities uh, and no water. Thank you. Uh, one bulb uh, for each 18 by 12 living space in which six to eight people uh, might live. But it was incredibly difficult for women uh, to use outdoor latrines with, they were simply holes, uh, a foot apart, no partitions. Uh, and uh, it was just a humiliation to a very proud people. The, but the other thing which was totally inadvertent really, uh, was that it was an army camp. There was mess hall dining. So that suddenly family dining ended and the kids being kids all wanted to eat with their friends. You know, they'd run away from their parents and the parents literally, in a very patriarchal society, lost control of their children uh, because of that, and families began to break up. They had to make miserable decisions. The young men who went into the military after 1943 became the most decorated soldiers in American history, but every one of them, at a minimum, had to bear the, what bitterness they had about the fact that their parents were, were in concentration camps. But beyond that, there was also the pull of whether they should stay to help their parents who were getting older or whether they should go to war for their country. And most went to war for, for their country, but that too ripped up uh, their families. The, 440, the segregated units of Japanese soldiers, uh, 30,000 men fought, 18,000 were casualties, uh, 18, uh, won Congressional Medals of Honor, the most of it in a unit uh, in the war. Uh, but then when they came back, people had taken their property. Uh, Dan Inouye, who later became a U.S. Senator uh, and lost an arm in Italy and won a Medal of Honor, uh, passed through San Francisco on his way home and walked in with all his combat ribbons. He was one of the most decorated soldiers we had and they threw him out of the barber shop saying, we don't cut Jap hair. I don't care where you've been. We have a number of superb questions from our audience that, that, I, that I want to get to. I, uh, I want to ask you um, just quickly to say one word about the recruitment difference, which I found stunning between the camps in Hawaii and what that says about the wartime wisdom of the policy. Uh, well, I, I don't know if it's one word. He, uh, the Hawaiians were much more, they were free. And so that when, there had been 3,000 Japanese Americans in the army before the war, they were dismissed, discharged immediately, some jailed. Uh, same thing with college students, the college I teach at, University of Southern California, uh, the next day uh, removed all the Japanese American students and then 60 years later gave them honorary uh, diplomas. It was a little late, uh, but the uh, they, when the Hawaiians were allowed to en enlist, people like Dan in a way, they literally ran through the streets and the fields to the enlistment uh, offices, recruiting offices, and they had to be taken in smaller doses because they they were looking to to get, as I recall. Uh, 
1,200 and 10,000 surrounded uh, the recruiting station. Then when the Americans, as I said, the choice that they had in the camp was, uh, was extremely difficult. And they, uh, and they were quite different people and they disliked each other intensely. The Hawaiians were much darker. They were plantation workers. Uh, they spoke a kind of Creole, a mix of English, Japanese, and Hawaiian. The Americans were graduates of Stanford, of Berkeley, of USC. Uh, they were light-skinned, uh, and they didn't gamble and carouse, which the Hawaiians loved to do. Of course, the Hawaiians didn't know that they were sending every penny they made back to their parents in the camps. A very smart uh, colonel in the, they were being trained in Shelby, Mississippi. Uh, a very smart colonel, as the army had decided, they were, they were gonna break up those units. That they, the fighting among the, between the Hawaiians and the Americans was just too great. Uh, this colonel took a group of the Hawaiians, led by Dan in a way, who was then a sergeant, to the, to the camp, for a, camp in Arkansas for a social weekend. And they were stunned. They saw the same. When they got there, they thought it was a prisoner of war camp. Again, the guns were pointing in, and there were tanks outside because there had been some trouble. And they couldn't believe it. And Dan Inouye came back and called the Hawaiians together at Shelby and said, we have totally misunderstood these people. These people's parents are being held. These men are better than we are. And that saved the uh, Japanese Americans in the war. I, I want to add one other thing too, that uh, this was never known. It was a total secret. 6,000 Japanese Americans served in the Pacific as translators, interrogators, and cave flushers. Jap Imperial Japanese wouldn't surrender, and these guys would go in unarmed and talk them out of the caves and off some islands. They would, our, our soldiers, Japanese American soldiers, would, it was called a military intelligence service, would swim to the islands and talk the Japanese into surrendering or even sometimes tell them that the war was over. Uh, but that was never, it was never known to the American people that those 6,000 Japanese Americans were out there. I think a lot, a lot of people, I think, know at some level about the Go For Broke Regiment, but that, that was, and you have a quote in the book from a military guy saying, right. essentially, never have so many saved so many millions of lives. In Charles Willoughby, who so was executive officer uh, to General Douglas MacArthur, said he thought that those 6,000 uh, young Japanese Americans uh, had cut the war short by two years, Pacific War, uh, and saved a million lives. So some good questions here. Uh, in, in your research, did you find any evidence that President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 so he'd carry the West Coast in the next presidential election? Yes. Uh, but also beyond that, Roosevelt, like many men of his generation, believed in eugenics. And with the help of the Smithsonian Institute, he had concluded that the Japanese were aggressive because of the shape of their skulls and that it would take them 2,000 years to reach the level of civilization of Caucasians. Well, we found out about that, but uh, the, uh, he, he believed things that today are laughable. He also thought about castrating German officers. Uh, so, but beyond that, it was, I mean, that was his own personal idiosyncrasies or ignorance, uh, but politics was, was all, and he thought if this became an issue, he could lose the West in 1944. Then and that's what people like William Justice uh, Douglas and Justice Hugo Black, two of the great liberals in American history, uh, but they backed the president, as Roger Baldwin did. They were willing to lie uh, and break the law to support the president. And that's what people do in wartime. That's a perfect segue to the next two questions. I'm going to read them both. They're, they're getting at the same issue. 
uh, number one is based on this incident, <clears throat> plus continuing incidents, McCarthy, anti-communist acts, civil rights, violence, et cetera. Whenever we are afraid of something, now internment of undocumented aliens, uh, are we learning anything? And then the second question is, and I think this is probably why you wrote the book, this is a perfect example of the Constitution being put on hold because of fear of the other. Do you believe we have learned a lesson, or could this happen again in the United States? There's no doubt in my mind that, that it could happen again if people were uh, were afraid enough, uh, and it and were racist enough, and and the other people look. I mean, the, the crime of the Japanese was they looked like the enemy, uh, and new people looking in there. If you spend any time in Midwestern small Midwestern towns where, where Mexican and Latin American workers are beginning to go. These are people who've never seen uh, people who looked like them. And there are troubles, uh, small troubles, and hopefully we'll stay small in, in places like that when we deal with the other. You have a line about uh, <clears throat> we rely on immigrants because we need them, uh, but they do not look like us until suddenly they are us. They are, yeah. yeah. And us, by us, the people in this room. Uh, on that issue, uh, there's a question that says, several years ago, there was an article in the Philadelphia Inquirer, I think, re regarding the unknown to the public incarceration of small numbers of Italian Americans in New Jersey, or in the Northeast. Uh, true comment. And I, and I and ask you to elaborate on the story you tell in your book yeah, about okay, I will. Joe DiMaggio's father and how greed plays into the different treatment. Well, here. the... Uh, yes, uh, several thousand Germans and Italians uh, were interned. The word internment means you are not a citizen. Aliens, enemy aliens can be interned, and that's legal. Uh, the, and of course, I, it, I happened to speak in Yorkville in New York City last night, uh, which was the center of the German-American Bund. And those people were directly loyal to Hitler, and they meant it. Uh, and they were picked up by the FBI uh, as soon as the Germans uh, declared war. Italians were not considered such a, uh, if, it, if we did to Italians and Germans what we did to the Japanese Americans, we would have had to have camps for 50 million people. Because almost all of us are, have some Italian or some German in us, and it was one drop of Japanese blood that got you there. The Ezio Pinza, the first basso of the uh, Metropolitan Opera and later the star of South Pacific, uh, lived in Bronxville. His wife was American, and there came a day where five FBI agents appeared in his office. They hadn't knocked or anything. They just came in and grabbed them. Uh, made him throw everything that was in the house around. They looked through the books finally, and then they took him away. Uh, and as they were going out the door, they saw, one of them says, wait, and there was a letter there written in Italian. And the, uh, the FBI agent said, what's that? And Pinzer says, that's a letter from Verdi. And uh, the FBI man said, who's Verdi? <laughs> uh, now, how did Pinza was put on Ellis Island in a solitary for five months, had a nervous breakdown. He'd probably still be there if it wasn't the fact he had an aggressive wife, and he also had uh, uh, the mayor of New York, Ferrell LaGuardia, uh, his parents were, had never become citizens. And so they could have been arrested, though people, we didn't do it as much in the East. Uh, in the West, the, I, I want to tell you why Pinzer went to jail. This is what fear yeah. is like. The second Basso, who wanted to be the first Basso, told the FBI that Pinzer was a personal agent of, of Mussolini and a friend of his, and that he signaled every Saturday during the afternoon broadcast of the Metropolitan Opera to Mussolini by changing the tone of his voice. Uh, so the FBI took uh, Pinza away. On the West Coast, they had an enormous problem. If you remember gerrymandering 
from school. This is 1941. School from the last election. What? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, uh, he, uh, they had to find a way to, cre the, the whole legal thing was based on the fact that there would be a war zone and anybody could be removed. And again, only the uh, Japanese Neander were removed and Italian fishermen. If you owned a boat, you were arrested and the, and the government took your boat and freedom both. Uh, one of the, uh, so, but one of the lines, instead of going this way, goes in like this and then comes back out. And right there is the house of an Italian farmer, uh, a fisherman, and alien who had never applied for citizenship, whose son was Joe DiMaggio. And they knew, even the army knew, they could not get away with arresting Joe DiMaggio's parents, particularly in 1941, the year he hit in 56 straight games and was the most valuable player in the American League. But they still wouldn't let them, the DiMaggio's had a boat, but they wouldn't let them, uh, wouldn't let them go to the, the boat. Uh, foreign fishermen just uh, had, most of their boats were taken down the Panama Canal, which we, we patrolled. But meanwhile, there were a lot of people coveting the Japanese American lands, farms, yes. bus businesses, many of which were sold, as you say, right. for, for pennies was, on the dollar. Thing, right? you know, there were heroes, there were people who, I mean, after all, these people were our neighbors. There were people who protected their neighbors' lands, shared their profits. There were others who burned down their houses and stole the land. What one of our uh, audience members asks: What was the significance of the 1924 date that you talked about with the, I believe the. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, I, the name escapes me now. There are two names. Uh, it was uh, we passed an immigration law, which we're going to do again someday, uh, in 1924. That's how that happened. The Chinese. There had been another immigration law in 1902, barring the Chinese from citizenship, but they regained the right to become citizens during the war because they were allies. The Japanese didn't uh, get the right back until 1952. Uh, this is a remarkable one. My name is Frank Ono. I was 18 when the war started going to college and was interned at Manzanar for three and a half years. That's Frank Dona. Thank you for coming. Yeah, those are the heroes. Uh, what, what was the process or logic in determining the locations of the camps? Indian reservations. Uh, dried up lake beds. The Manzanar was in the Owens Valley of California. If you saw the movie Chinatown or know that story, that was the, those were the waters that were drained to feed Los Angeles. So what you had there what constantly was about a foot high of dust, and then when the wind blew, more dust. Uh, the harshest camp was probably the one in Tule Lake, California, uh, a young opera singer from San Diego who was one of the many characters in the book found out she was going to Tule Lake, so she made sure to pack a bathing suit. Uh, there had not been water in Tule Lake for 5,000 years. It was now a lava bed. But this is a very big country, and there are big, big deserts in Arizona, big swamps uh, in Arkansas. They sent teams out to find the most unlivable places in the country they could. And if they could, as far from any settlements uh, as they could be. The Japanese were restricted to the camps. The kids might go out fishing if nobody was around, and some of the men did too. But compare that to the way German prison and Italian prisoners of war were treated. They were allowed to go to the towns near their camps. Many of them are still in the country because there were no American men around then. And uh, many of those Germans and Italians married 
uh, married American women and stayed as American citizens, but they were given much more freedom, much better food, much better facilities uh, than, the, than the Japanese citizens ever were. But meanwhile, as you point out, the, uh, the, there was a perception in some parts of the country and among some of the more xenophobic press that the Japanese Americans were being mollycoddled in the, in, well, in, 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 in the, the camps. There were many campaigns during the, some of the Denver Post was among, uh, was among the worst. Uh, ironically, a boy from the camps years later became the editor of the Denver Post, Bill Huskawa. Uh, but they were, there were all sorts of stories that uh, everything was rationed. Uh, remember, I mean, th those of us who were old enough to know, you only got so much butter, so much this. Uh, it came out that in some places, the Japanese were, were uh, eating pretty well because they were fantastic farmers. And they were growing not only vegetables, and which they craved, it, they were being fed wieners and food left over from World War I, like K rations, and, and they, their stomachs couldn't handle it because they were used to a much healthier diet. Uh, so they began to raise turkeys to grow gardens, calling them victory gardens, just as we did on the outside. And when the Denver Post found out that they had turkeys at Thanksgiving, which they had grown themselves, uh, and which they, in fact, were raising enough that the camps were selling them for the profit of the U.S. government. Hmm. But the country went nuts over the fact that uh, the prisoners, the incarcerated Japanese Americans, uh, had a better Thanksgiving than some of them did. Hmm. Uh one uh, audience member writes, Roosevelt was firm and overran objections to reverse economic problems. Why did he not stop the internment? Uh, and uh, to that I would add, particularly when he had better intelligence, both right. at the beginning. Even at the beginning. And the military quickly right. came to the view this was not right. working. The intelligence at the beginning was, we had, uh, there's a particular hero in the book, a, a, a Navy lieutenant commander named Ken Ringel, uh, whose son I know is a reporter for the Washington Post, uh, Ken Ringel spoke Japanese, very uncommon thing in those days, and uh, had served six years in Tokyo. He was put in charge of finding out uh, what the Japanese plans were. Were there fifth column plans? Uh, he recruited a group of safe crackers from San Quentin who broke into the offices of the Japanese consuls, and what they found out going through the papers were that the uh, Japanese did not trust American Japanese. They were sure that they were loyal to the United States and that they, and they were ordered to stay away from them and concentrating on whether they could recruit communists and Negroes to do spying for Japan. Roosevelt had access to all this information plus uh, plus a lot more. But the political hysteria had built up, uh, again largely fed by Warren, uh, who was testifying before Congress with some fairly bizarre theories about Japanese plots, including the fact that they were growing their uh, tomatoes, so they pointed to American air bases and factories, right. uh, and that so the Japanese pilots overhead would be able to know uh, where to drop the bombs. Uh, but the real motivation was, uh, as he went from Dr. New Deal to Dr. Win the War, is that Roosevelt had a lot of other things in his mind, and the only thing about it that bothered him were his wife's columns in the newspaper denouncing it, <laughs> and, uh, and the, the upcoming election which he thought would be a close election, and was relatively close. And if he had lost the West, uh, he would have been defeated by, uh, by Thomas E. Dewey at that, mm. at that time. Easter 1943, Eleanor Roosevelt visited the camp. She knew the director, uh, who had, he quit, couldn't take it anymore, it was Milton Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower's brother, uh, and he couldn't take it. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't eat because he knew it was wrong. Uh, 
And Eleanor Roosevelt visited three camps over that Easter week. And her husband, on another train, visited uh, army camps. Now, by then, there were Japanese Americans in uh, the army. They were, before the president came, they were rounded up, uh, driven 10 miles and more outside their bases, and locked into aircraft, uh, aircraft hangars so that the president would not see them. Mm. So we, we'll, we'll have one more, and then uh, I'll just say a few things to wrap us up, but uh, an appropriate one to end on. Um, please give some information on the laws that are still on the books about this subject that caused you to worry. Uh, no, say that again. Uh, oh, please, the laws. Please give some more information on the, the laws. The whole, are, no. uh, the military operation was put by a very mediocre old, you know, our army was not in great shape between the wars. I mean, in those days, uh, and again, at the end of World War II, we tried to demobilize as quickly as possible. And the career officers left in uh, tended to be the people that uh, probably couldn't get, uh, certainly couldn't get as good a job outside. John DeWitt, the commander of the Fourth Army, which was the West Coast, uh, was one. But he was dumb, he was a racist, and he couldn't make up his mind. He was, he was a fool. He found, well, he didn't find, Washington assigned him a bright young attorney named Carl Vendetson who worked out the laws uh, that govern, that this is the war zones, uh, and they were done, they were made before, the, by then, uh, when that was happening, the Japanese Americans were living in stables at racetracks, the assembly centers they were called, and livestock pavilions before the camps uh, were built, and nobody was quite sure how to deal with all that. Ben Detson was the guy who came up with the strategy of uh, declaring a war zone and that citizens and aliens alike could be moved as a matter of national security. Those laws are still in the books. That's why I say we could do it tomorrow. Although the Supreme Court ruled that the arrest of the, of the, the, uh, the Japanese uh, who filed suit, these young uh, civil liberties lawyers filed, filed for them, uh, uh, but the, uh, they, the Supreme Court never uh, ruled on the constitutionality of the war zone strategy and the roundup itself. I don't know how they could have, because they were citizens they were rounding up. John McCloy, uh, the Deputy Secretary of War, and a famous Wall Street lawyer, one of the wise men, as they were called, uh, said at this period, uh, look, I'm a Wall Street lawyer. The Constitution is just a scrap of paper to me. Scary words that we should worry when we hear. And on, on that note, I want to uh, remind everyone that books are available for signing in the uh, gift shop downstairs. Uh, I want to close with a few notes of thanks to the Constitution Center staff and its superb leader, Jeff Rosen, uh, to all of you who are the lifeblood of the place, uh, and to a very distinguished historian and author for giving us uh, something, an important book about an important chapter in our history. And then finally, uh, since the Constitution Center once gave the predecessor to the Liberty Medal to the surviving members of the Gopher Broke Regiment uh, many years ago, to a uh, final salute and thanks to the generation about which you wrote. Uh, my thanks to all of you, and thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whoa. That was terrific. We got this.